Hello, if I may have your attention, I'm Cheryl Swinegar, Director of the Economic Growth Program at the New America Foundation, and we're very pleased that you could come out on a very rainy day. Uh, there will be a few, or quite a few additional people drifting in, I think the inclement weather and some problem on K Street may have, may have slowed everyone arriving, so I, I will fill up a little bit of air time. Uh, so that many people don't uh, miss the, uh, the, the, the main event. Uh, this is the latest in a series of what we've c called growth seminars or symposiums that the Economic Growth Program have hosted over the last few years <coughs> in an effort to try to understand the nature of the crisis that we're undergoing and to chart a, a growth path out of it. Uh, interestingly, it was four years ago, virtually to the day, that we held the first symposium. And, and the lead speaker at that, uh, pres at that symposium was Simon Johnson, who was then director of research at the IMF. And Simon laid out in a very sobering and alarming detail the size of the housing and credit bubbles, not just in the US, and just not in those circles where you had the largest housing bubbles, but, but also in Europe. And, and Simon and other speakers sort of foretold the seriousness and the gravity of what was going to unfold in the months that, that fall. Since that point, in putting on these programs, we've had three essential working working assumptions. Uh, first, uh, this is not what we've experienced is not a normal business cycle recession. It was the result, as as Simon Johnson in that initial seminar pointed out, the largest credit and asset bubble in world financial history, and therefore. Uh, we've approached this that, that conventional, the, the conventional macroeconomic tools would have severe and serious limits. They were important, but we would need to be much more radical in our approach. The second working assumption that we have had is that the crisis has been global and systemic in its nature. It just wasn't a U.S. financial system crisis. It was a product of global imbalances and a global pattern of, of growth and, and development over the last couple, couple decades. And therefore, since it affected large parts of the other world, and particularly the, the Eurozone, there was going to be no easy global trade adjustment path out of this. The US would not be able to, to count on the rest of the world cooperating. Indeed, the danger would be one of beggar by neighbor policies, competitive devaluations, not necessarily the US being able to grow uh, as others expanded their, their own, own demand. The third working assumption that we've had in putting on these, these um, symposium is about the crisis is that austerity at best is a dead end and it, at worst very counterproductive. The heart of the problem still, uh, even after uh, three to four years of deleveraging, is on the one hand a dead overhang and on the other hand still an enormous imbalance between supply and demand in the world. There is simply too much labor, too much capital, too much productive capacity that is laying, laying idle in many of the economies of, of the world. Obviously, there are areas of tighter demand, tighter supply, but by and large, our problem can't be solved by austerity because that gives rise to the danger that the three authors of the paper we're featuring today uh, of, of debt deflation. So our emphasis has been on growth, debt relief, and rebalancing growth by finding new sources of economic growth as the economy rebalances. 
But today we're going to feature um, uh, a, an important paper in this series that I think picks up, that builds on these working assumptions that we've had in these growth symposium. The paper uh, titled The Way Forward, an optimistic note that indeed there is a non-austerity path out of this, uh, moving from the post-bubble, <coughs> post-bust economy to renewed growth and competitiveness. <coughs> and we're going to begin with the three authors of that paper, uh, Daniel Alpert, uh, Robert Hockett, and Nuriel Rubini, to give us an overview of how they see the problem still afflicting the U.S. and the world economies and how their program that they have outlined in their paper allows us to work our way through it in a healthier growth-oriented growth way. That will take up the first 30 minutes. Then we will have a larger panel discussion in which we will bring in uh, some additional voices and additional perspectives on the nature of, of the, the risk currently to the U.S. economy and what the prospects for, for a sustained economic recovery program are. In, in this case, we have Leo Hendry at the far end of the table, uh, Bruce Bartlett and Liaquat Ahmed, uh, and they will uh, form the, the second phase of uh, kick off the second phase, which will be a larger panel discussion in which we will then work also in the, the authors of the paper. And finally, we'll, we'll, we'll save uh, time for questions and comments uh, from the audience. So we begin the first phase, which is uh, uh, Dan, Bob, and Nuriel with a, a presentation of the main points of their, their paper. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm afraid Bob and, and I are the, the warm-up act uh, for the guys to the left of us, uh, but you'll uh, hopefully tolerate it. Um, the uh, paper that we wrote uh, really breaks into two or three different sections. One is sort of telling the story of what happened. The second one is uh, explaining why people have gotten it all wrong. Uh, and then finally, uh, some prescriptions on what we need to do. And so. Um, we're going to walk you through this as quickly as possible. Some of the stuff, uh, uh, some of the graphs and charts you're going to see are things that two years ago would have made everybody's eyes bug out, but today they're kind of accepted. So, uh, but I think they're necessary in order to lay the groundwork. So, uh, you know, the credit bubble in the United States saw aggregate debt uh, double during the period of time from uh, 2000 through the end of the bubble. It went from uh, already elevated 273% to 360%. Uh, this was a continuation of a trend. As you can see, uh, we were uh, flat debt to GDP uh, prior to the 1980s, and starting in the 1980s, things changed. As you can also note on the, on the chart to the left, uh, the things slowed down a little bit in the 1990s when we had this wonderful productivity boost. It's what I call growth that's bought and paid for and not borrowed. Uh, and that really is, in fact, what, what happened. Uh, in raw dollars, uh, the issue is, is even more uh, dramatic. Uh, as you can see, starting in, uh, in the early 80s, uh, we went uh, from uh, below $10 trillion of debt <clears throat> all the way up to uh, its current 52. And by the way, don't let anybody fool you. Total debt outstanding in this country is still hovering around 52. It's just shifted from one pocket to the other. Um, the, uh, the biggest climb, of course, as you can see, was during the previous decade. So uh, the, the basic uh, construct of the paper is all of this would be bad enough. We'd get a <coughs> conventional Irving Fisher style debt deflation uh, and we'd be in trouble for a while. But the problem is, is that something else was going on. And so uh, the three of us spent a lot of time trying to think through, I know Nuriel and I have been discussing it for four years, um, think through all of the things that really come into the equation of, of why this time is different and why this time is, is, is very special. And the thing that, that I've been focused on for a very long time, obviously, is the uh, end of, of the socialist era and the release of three and a half billion people in the BRIC countries into competition uh, with the United States and the other developed countries. So, we, you know, we have created an enormous imbalance, which has created an excess supply of labor, <coughs> of productive capacity, and ultimately of capital. Uh, a lot of the debt that you saw in the first graph 
is really the capital being earned by uh, uh, folks in the developing countries coming back at us in, 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 the, in the form of, uh, of treasury purchases. So we looked like we were doing okay, right? We looked like we were doing fine because we had plenty of cash to spend. And of course, this creates very, very low interest rates. Uh, but the problem is, is the prosperity that we saw or what we thought was prosperity, which was really the act of going progressively into debt, um, was, was ephemeral. It wasn't real. And uh, the reason for that we'll, we'll explore a little bit further. I think as, a, as an additional point, we need to point out that this situation hasn't been uh, in its current state just over the course of the bubble. Really, at the end of that big prosperity boost due to, the, uh, due to Internet technology and all the wonderful things that happened uh, in that period, uh, credit the private sector, discredit the Bill Clinton administration theory that just because he was in office, everything was fine. The answer is he was a great president, no problem with that, but let's face it, this was real private sector productivity. It equates to the invention of the railroad, the radio, whatever element of, of great advance you want to point to. The problem is when that was over, we entered a period of massive stagnation in U.S. median family incomes, and as you can see, uh, things have been fundamentally flat going all the way back to 1997. Now, arguably, the prosperity continued beyond 97. I'm aware of that, so you saw a little peak and valley in there. But um, the, uh, the, the truth is, is that this is a situation that is not, that is not tenable for a prolonged period of time. Um, what's a bubble look like? This, this is kind of a very easy way to understand a bubble. What this chart does, and it's very small, and I know you can't read it, um, it looks at the inflation-adjusted movement in prices of all of the inputs that you could possibly think related to housing, right? In this case, we have rents, we have building materials, we have the cost of labor to build houses, all of the various things except one element, which is land, right? And the big uh, blue line that goes up and down, that's obviously the price of housing. This is inflation adjusted, so you don't see the conventional, you know, Case-Shiller indices that you would be familiar with. You, you have to take out inflation, and this is what it really looked like. Um, as you can see, the prices of nothing else really budged during that entire period of time. What really happened was we saw an enormous uh, debt-driven, credit-driven uh, expansion in the, in the price of homes. Uh, and, that, and that occurred really uh, simply because people were shoving money out and they had no place to go. So it went into the one thing that's very, very hard to value, and that is the other component in housing, which is land. Effectively, we had a massive land bubble, except nobody could see that. They just saw the houses that were built on top of the land. Um, what went on with our labor force during this entire period of time? So we've had this wonderful thing going on in the United States, and you know we should all be very proud of it. Uh, starting in the late 70s, we saw this enormous expansion in labor force participation by virtue of the fact that women entered the labor force, right? Now, economists can sit there and say, well, women entering the labor force, that costs us their free labor at, in households and all sorts of things, so you have to net that out. Okay, fine, but the fact that we absorbed an enormous number of people, uh, you know, into into the labor force and saw labor force participation go up from you know the 60s level of the high 50s all the way up into the high 60s is quite spectacular. The problem is, of course, if you ramp over to 2000, we've been going down for a while, and and not only that, after the recession and during the recession, after the recession, we've really plummeted. Uh, there's been a little uptick in the last couple of months. That's good. Uh, that uptick, in my opinion, is ha happening for the wrong reasons, and that is that people are falling off the back of their unemployment benefits, and in fact, they're willing to take lower-priced jobs. And so we're seeing nominal wages bobble around right now, and I believe are going to fall. Obviously, real wages have fallen considerably. Um, what's the other impact of credit that we think is very interesting? Well, this graph shows uh, per capita adjusted personal income, and it strips out all of the elements of personal income that don't relate to actually going to work and earning a living. Uh, and so what you have is that line contrasted with growth rates. These are growth rates. These aren't absolutes. Uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, these are index numbers, not, uh, not the absolutes. Um, average hourly earnings of production and non-supervisory workers. This is the 82% of all wage earners who you know, aren't the bosses. Uh, and you, you contrast the, the growth rate in both, and you'll see going back to 1964, which is when the data starts, they parallel each other perfectly. They're laid on top of each other. Everybody, the whole, everybody's growing at the same rate. Yes, the rich people have more money and the poor people have less money, but at the end of the day, everybody's growing at the same rate. And you then see this massive divergence, 
There are a lot of things that folks in this room who, who study economics can point to that could cause that. There's demographic issues, there's all sorts of things. But it just so happens that that point of divergence also correlates with the point of divergence in the expansion of debt in this country. And so, to a certain extent, you can say that the debt, which obviously isn't the debt of the blue line people, it's the debt of the red line people, um, <laughs> is, is, is pushing more money up to the blue line people. And so this, this is something that we think over time is going to need to be evaluated. Everybody looks at income inequalities in the form of uh, quintiles and which group has more than another group and what's the gap between them. We like this chart, over my firm at least, because we think it expresses this uh, in a way that understands the, the nature of the gradualism and how it kind of snuck up on us while we were looking. Um, so where are we now? We've got uh, uh, 25 million uh, working age Americans who are unemployed or underemployed. Our employment population ratio, which uh, this slide's a little bit old because we gave it in October. Uh, it's ticked up a little bit since then, I think two tenths of a point, uh, for, is now 58.5%. Uh, uh, we have only 112 million, and this is really an interesting number. We have 112 million full-time workers and 26 million part-time workers supporting a population of 312 million people. Um, think, just let that go into your head for a little bit. That, that's, that's quite something. That, that is really quite amazing. And of course, that population's aging. It's a demographic issue we didn't explore in this paper another, another time. Um, Part-time employment. A lot of what you hear is, is employment is really part-time, right? And the, the government uh, has a wonderful number called uh, uh, workers who are part-time for economic reasons. Uh, it is uh, extremely uh, easy to see on this chart what happened in 2008. Uh, we had this enormous uh, blow up in the number of people who were working part time for economic reasons. That number uh, has been bobbling around the eight million uh, to nine million dollar, uh, eight million nine million person level now for uh, really since the uh, the end of the recession, and uh, it, it isn't coming down. Uh, and, and so that, that's one thing that when you look at the headline unemployment number, you need to keep in mind these are not necessarily people who are employed in, in long-time jobs. So um, we, we asked the question, you know, what's happening? Well, something's happening and it's starting to become very, very clear. We asked why this credit bubble is different than all others in modern history. Why is the slump so resistant uh, to conventional uh, recovery? Uh, why uh, this uh, debt overhang is the most massive in, in modern history, and we turn to the next page to sort of start giving you the answers. Um, we contrasted the bubble of this last decade with that of the only other real credit bubble that we can point to in modern history, which was during the 1980s. Now, what do we define as a credit bubble? A credit bubble is a period of time that, that uh, where credit grows at a rate or rather debt to GDP grows at a rate in excess of 2% for a protracted period of a number of years. So in other words, it doesn't go below that level, right? And there are only two periods that that applies to. We called one the great credit bubble of 2001, 2009, the other one the lesser credit bubble of 82, 87. And as you can see, when we overlay real median family income, and again, this is rate of change, you can see that the red line, which is median income rate of change during the lesser bubble of the 1980s, did what it usually does, which is parallel growth, right? You had growth, you saw median income go up. Uh, in fact, median income is actually quite a wonderful number. If you look back in the 1960s, uh, credit growth actually was negative for a period of time, right? But you still had median income growth. So you really never had a period of time when you look at this entire graph that things broke down the way they did all the way to the right, where we had massive increase of credit but no real growth that percolated down to the level of households. So uh, household, you know, real median income actually deteriorated net-net, and when you look on that, uh, uh, the next one, you'll, you'll look at household net worth, what did this really translate into? This wonderful upward sloping line and this beautiful trend line that's, that's shown there uh, that, that kind of fell apart uh, in the late 1990s. We had, obviously, the, uh, uh, the tech wreck, uh, the collapse of the equity markets that caused that first little drop off. But then you'll see a uh, massive credit creation created this ephemeral wealth that literally just went away, um, that, which is that big peak over to the far right. 
Um, and so really where we're at now is we're right back where we were in 1997. Uh, and, and this, I'm sorry, that's housing. This is uh, January 2000, my, my mistake. I get my numbers confused. But yes, and, and back, back in 2000, we've had no improvement net-net in, in household net worth. And as you can see, look at the period of time of the 1980s, right? Which is that other credit bubble. It, it, it's a pimple by comparison. Um, so ultimately, the numbers, it's all in the data, right? We look at the, the, the bubble of the 1980s. We see that households coming out of the other end uh, saw aggregate real median income growth of about 12%. Uh, they saw a net worth growth of about 30% from beginning to end of the bubble. The numbers are here on an annualized average basis as well. And of course, when you look at this in the current bubble, you see negative numbers and very, very flat uh, household net worth numbers. So that, that, that to us is sort of explaining, you know, why this time is, is very, very different. And so what worries us, uh, Nuriel and Bob and ourselves, is that um, this is an issue of insufficiency of demand relative to excess supply. You know, we've been living in a supply side <coughs> universe. Now, people in this room live in Washington. You, you're familiar with, with, uh, with the debate between uh, uh, the supply siders and, and pretty much everybody else. Um, and, uh, and, and the truth is, is that the concern back in the 1970s, which was quite legitimate, was that we did have, uh, demonstrably, an inadequacy of supply relative to demand. Things have changed so dramatically, and due to a historical event, due to the event that, that occurred in, uh, uh, with, with the release of the uh, previously socialist uh, populations. So we now have this excess of supply relative to demand. We call it demand deficit. Uh, we have deflation in debtor nations. Uh, and the absence of the ability to debase debtor nation's currencies is a huge problem, which I'm sure Nuriel will talk a little bit about later, uh, which is, you know, we have an involuntary currency alliance between the United States and China. China is not allowing us to uh, devalue our currency. Uh, and in fact, they are now, as of about two weeks ago, seriously trying to devalue theirs uh, because they're fearing weakness going forward. Uh, and of course, Europe is tied up in a complete mess, which you all know about and Nuriel will talk about, but I, the bottom line is we have a choice at this point. We either need to uh, do something about the demand side, forget about the supply side, we need to do, do something about the demand side or we're going to be facing a Japanese-style continuous uh, stagnation. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Bob, who's going to take us through the next several slides. You use this button. Thanks, Dan. So um, a, a sort of a core uh, proposition that we're putting forth in the paper uh, is that one of the reasons that um, initiatives tried thus far to sort of get us out of the current slump um, have, have all failed uh, is because they're all predicated on misdiagnoses of the problem. Uh, so Dan, of course, has just uh, given you a kind of quick and dirty uh, version of our uh, diagnosis of the problem. And our thought, our working proposition here is, our working assumption is that if we do a decent job of actually diagnosing the problem, uh, then the solutions that we have to offer will sort of recommend themselves in effect. They'll appear all the more compelling uh, to all of those who otherwise would have been skeptical. So what I'm going to do is uh, first begin to say a little bit about the misdiagnoses that we understand as, as having been, you know, sort of incorrectly done uh, in contrast to the diagnosis that we've given, uh, and then move on uh, to the sort of criteria uh, that an adequate uh, program of response to the current demand uh, deficit uh, would, would, would feature, uh, and then begin uh, to talk about our three-pillared uh, plan, essentially by focusing on pillar one, then I'll hand it back over to Dan for pillar two, and Nuriel will take over uh, pillar three. Um, so as far as the misdiagnoses uh, that we've had thus far, and the conventional policies that have um, uh, responded to them uh, are concerned, uh, first of all, uh, one uh, policy response that was attempted was uh, so-called uh, monetary uh, reflation, uh, whereby, uh, of course, uh, the Fed uh, grew the money supply uh, uh, in order to respond uh, to the quick uh, freezing up of, of credit markets. While uh, liquidity provision was, was wise policy at the time, uh, we argue that, it, of course, it's reached the sort of outer limits of its effectiveness uh, now. So monetary reflation did make sense, uh, again, in the <coughs> early stages, um, but uh, it, it has uh, sort of run out of, um, it's, it, it's no longer effective. So uh, quantitative easing, uh, as one of the more recent uh, uh, 
uh, sort of shapes that uh, monetary reflation has taken, um, basically underwrites only fleetingly uh, positive wealth effects, we say. And eventually, um, those fleetingly positive wealth effects are more than offset uh, by rising costs uh, in the commodities markets, which also, uh, unfortunately, tend to hit disproportionately hard uh, those at the lower ends of the income uh, ladder. Uh, likewise, uh, limited uh, direct uh, credit easing uh, could, you know, maybe still help a, a bit, um, but it's not likely to, to make much uh, appreciable difference uh, over what we've uh, experienced uh, thus far. Um, next, um, I guess was another switch over. Yeah, there, uh, there continues to be, um, you know, sort of uh, ongoing debate uh, about the effectiveness or the efficacy of, of, of quantitative easing and, and maybe possible further rounds of quantitative easing. Um, but we think that the uh, the tape, um, uh, as we as we call it here, uh, actually tells the tale. Uh, so what you see here uh, basically is um, uh, the the red line, of course, is the CPI. Uh, blue is uh, the average hourly uh, earnings. You don't see uh, a great deal of of rise uh, in either of those uh, during uh, the period of of QE. Uh, you do see, uh, on the other hand, uh, sort of quick, uh, brief, ephemeral, um, transitory uh, rises in the S&P 500 and more uh, dramatically still in the commodities indices, uh, which of course uh, is represented by the purple uh, line. Uh, and you note that once uh, QE policies were uh, backtracked from and discontinued, uh, those commodities prices came back down. So what you saw is essentially a very temporary uh, bubble in commodities prices uh, as a result of QE. So we, we view this as, as, as further evidence uh, that QE is not likely to be altogether helpful uh, in future, that we've essentially uh, made the best use uh, those kinds of policies that we can, and, and, and now there's not much more to be done with them. Uh, next, another uh, feature uh, of sort of recent uh, attempts at, 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 uh, at stimulus uh, is uh, the reliance uh, heavily on, on diffuse or indirect demand stimulation, uh, especially through uh, tax policy. Uh, uh, and our argument here is that, first of all, uh, in a globalized economy with excess capacity and ongoing private sector delivering, uh, tax cuts tend simply to be uh, hoarded by those who are retrenching and trying to deliver rather than being used to pay down debt. Um, you can view this as one instance uh, of many uh, that might fall under the more general rubric uh, of what you, uh, what economists out there will know is a collective action problem, that basically when you've got a serious uh, demand uh, deficit problem, you can't expect it to be dealt with in a kind of unconcentrated or diffuse way because all it's individually rational for all of those individuals out there who are delivering to go ahead and hoard. Uh, uh, so in effect, what you really need is a concentrated spender if you're going to uh, rely on spending of last resort uh, to sort of reflate uh, or, or, or sort of reignite uh, the economy. Uh, likewise, uh, another uh, method that, that might be relied upon, at least in future, uh, to sort of help uh, boost or restore uh, growth uh, in the macro economy uh, would be, uh, it would take the form of trade adjustment. Uh, but the problem uh, with that, uh, at present at least, is that it's not currently available on a sufficient scale. Uh, and um, and the, the, the reasons are presumably fairly obvious. Um, you know, the principle would be generators of global demand. That uh, would be the EU on the one hand, uh, the US uh, on the other hand, uh, and then finally uh, uh, China and maybe some of the other emerging markets market economies. Uh, the EU and the US uh, clearly, of course, are going to be embarked upon uh, retrenchment uh, for their own parts over the next five to seven years uh, at least. Uh, that spells uh, a need to rely more on emerging market nations, uh, again, especially uh, China, but it's going to take a bit of time for them to ramp up. And of course, part of pillar three uh, that Nuriel will discuss uh, is, is, is concerned with sort of how to get them to ramp up um, or how to sort of facilitate and speed up that, that, that ramp up process. But in the meanwhile, uh, we'll have to uh, uh, adopt uh, more concentrated uh, demand stimulative policies of our own and, and, and debt forgiveness policies of our own over the next five to seven years. But we'll, we'll come to that when we turn to uh, pillars uh, one and uh, two. Um, there are also, uh, of course, um, uh, as, as you all know, uh, a number of proposals out there that seem to be proceeding on the basis of uh, no uh, diagnosis of all, uh, at all, uh, rather than uh, on, on incorrect uh, diagnoses. So, of course, fiscal austerity seems to be all the rage uh, in some policy circles, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, also here in the States, uh, and especially on one side of the aisle uh, in Congress. Uh, that, we think, is, of course, uh, wrong-headed, if not uh, disastrously so. Uh, it essentially uh, eggs on uh, the sort of vicious circle that we're faced with right now. That's uh, 
sort of vicious spiral uh, mm -hmm. into sort of long-term uh, uh, debt deflation and, and, and ongoing uh, recession. <coughs> um, uh, another uh, policy that's been proposed by, by some, by a few, and I think Ken Rogoff is one of these, uh, has been a deliberate monetary uh, inflation, right? The idea that you might have a, a kind of a stealth uh, uh, debt forgiveness plan in effect, essentially by uh, rendering uh, uh, debt sort of in, in real terms uh, less onerous than it would be, essentially by increasing uh, the, the, the rate of inflation and by sort of explicitly embracing, having the Fed, for example, explicitly embrace uh, an inflation target of somewhere around 5%. Uh, we don't think that that's a, a terrifically good idea uh, either, um, in particular owing to uh, the difficulty that um, is sort of historically known to uh, attend all such efforts. Once you let that sort of genie out of the bottle, as they, as they commonly say, uh, it's a bit difficult to, uh, to get it back in. Um, uh, so, uh, and again, the other thing, of course, uh, is uh, that um, you're unlikely to see wage rate growth uh, in, the, in the near term future that would match uh, any such inflation rate. And so you might in, indeed uh, exacerbate uh, the real rate, the real wage stagnation problem, which is one of the underlying causes uh, of, the, of the crisis uh, in the first place. Um, other uh, possible uh, possibilities um, out there that are uh, sort of offered is, you know, while waiting for uh, uh, the emerging markets to uh, increase um, the, the degree of demand that they add uh, to the global uh, economy. Again, in principle, that would be lovely. Uh, the problem is it's going to take a while. Uh, and again, so over the next five to seven years, which is essentially our sort of target period uh, with this policy paper, that's not going to cut it. Uh, so uh, the idea then is we have to do something uh, to sort of get us over the hump, so to speak, or we have to sort of provide a, a bridge that'll get us over the, the next five to seven year period until uh, you can actually have a real uh, appreciable uh, increases <coughs> in consumer demand uh, from the uh, emerging market nations. Uh, and then finally, uh, the sort of um, uh, sane-looking uh, policy proposal de jour uh, is the idea of uh, embracing short-term uh, stimulus uh, combined with a long-term fiscal consolidation. Um, stated at that level of abstraction, uh, this sounds fine. Uh, the principal problem uh, with this sort of style of proposal that you're uh, hearing, uh, particularly from the democratic side of the aisle uh, these days, uh, is in, in the particulars. Uh, and in, in particular, uh, what we're concerned about is that the stimulus that seems to be uh, contemplated by those who are advocating this new, at least semi-sane uh, solution, uh, is that it is, is very much like the previous stimuli up to now. Let's say it's uh, largely tax policy based, largely diffuse, hence it doesn't address the, uh, the basic sort of fundamental collective action problem that any debt deflation essentially amounts to. Uh, so uh, while we think that those who are uh, advocating short-term stimulus combined with a kind of credible com credible commitment to a longer-term fiscal consolidation <coughs> is, uh, have their hearts in the right place, um, their heads aren't quite there yet, and so we're hoping to sort of push them the rest uh, of, of, of the way. Um, all right, so uh, having, we hope, uh, sufficiently dispatched uh, the, uh, the sort of current uh, voguish uh, policy solutions that are offered out there, all of which we think are predicated either on false diagnoses or no diagnoses at all, uh, we turn uh, then uh, to uh, basically elaborating a few criteria uh, that we think any proper, uh, proper diagnosis-informed uh, uh, program uh, would, would, would feature. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, then, uh, we think that any uh, stimulus program in the coming uh, five to seven years is going to have to rely more on concentrated rather than uh, diffuse uh, demand. Uh, we have to be able seriously uh, to, to fill uh, the demand hole that we're likely to face uh, in the U.S. and global economies over the next five to seven years. Um, that hole, again, uh, you'll remember, is, is, is essentially uh, opened by consumer and private sector uh, uh, delivering. Uh, and insofar as that's the case, of course, simply uh, giving more tax cuts to those who we wish to spend more aren't going, isn't going to work. Uh, so the idea is what we have to do is, is rely on concentrated direct job stimulation uh, by a real concentrated spender of last resort. Insofar as a debt deflation is a collective action problem, the solution would seem to require action by a collective agent. That's what we uh, sometimes call government. Uh, and so uh, we are thinking in terms then of the US government actually uh, adopting a serious uh, infrastructure investment program, more on which uh, in a moment. By the same token, um, while you're sort of closing, right, the, the overhang uh, that's opened up between debt levels on the one hand and income levels on the other, one way to do that, of course, is increase income levels by boosting demand. But the other way to do it is, of course, to operate from the other end and trim back on the debt, uh, the debt end, uh, from the <coughs> debt end uh, of the overhang. So uh, another, um, then, uh, criterion that we think a workable plan is going to have to meet uh, is to address, uh, or to, at least to sort of expedite uh, the rate uh, uh, at which uh, ongoing delivering uh, takes uh, place. Uh, and so um, uh, any plan then ought to look 
seriously at the possibility of uh, serious uh, debt uh, restructuring and in some cases uh, debt forgiveness, but not uh, free lunch style uh, debt forgiveness, uh, as we'll elaborate soon, uh, in the um, uh, private sector. Okay, and then finally, a third, a third criterion uh, that we think any such um, any workable plan is going to have to meet is essentially any such plan is going to have to begin at least to address uh, in a serious way the longer term fundamental underlying problem uh, that that sort of fueled or, or sort of underwrote uh, the problem that we're now living with the consequences of in the first place, and that's the long term uh, global uh, imbalances, right? Essentially, the the the, uh, the, the global uh, oversupply uh, problem or supply glut. Um, so, in effect what we're going to have to do uh, is ultimately see much more demand generated by those very nations that have added so much uh, to global supply, throwing the world out of balance uh, in the first place. Uh, and that's going to require some real institutional reform uh, down the pike, and it's going to require some sort of simulated uh, institutional reform in the form of particular treaty arrangements or, or informal agreements uh, between certain uh, nations uh, in the shorter uh, to medium term. Now, conveniently enough, uh, each of these uh, three criteria uh, corresponds to one of our three uh, pillars. Uh, and so uh, we'll uh, now uh, begin to turn then to the plan itself that we have uh, to offer for, uh, for the next uh, five to seven years. Uh, so the way forward in detail uh, is indeed then this three-part uh, recovery plan. Uh, so uh, to begin with, uh, pillar what we're calling pillar one of the plan uh, involves a $1.2 trillion five-year uh, public investment uh, program uh, to target high return uh, public investments in energy, transportation, education, research and technology development, water treatment infrastructure uh, and the like. Uh, pillar two uh, and then uh, would, uh, involves a, a very complex, um, but we think optimally uh, complex or optimally uh, granular uh, debt restructuring uh, and uh, debt re uh, forgiveness uh, program and regulatory capital loss absorption uh, uh, plan uh, as well. And, and then finally, uh, pillar three, uh, uh, in the interest of uh, global rebalancing, uh, involves or includes a new G20 commitment to currency realignment, domestic demand growth, uh, and reduction of current account surpluses on the part of of the surplus nations, the emerging market nations. Also a G20 or IMF coordinated recycling of East Asian and petrodollar surpluses to support, uh, or to at least uh, help uh, support uh, economic recovery uh, in Europe and the Middle, uh, Middle East. So we'll begin, uh, what I'll do is I'll walk us through uh, quickly uh, a few of the details of Pillar 1, uh, the reemployment program, the public investment program. Uh, then I'll turn it back over to uh, Dan uh, to cover uh, Pillar 2 uh, on uh, debt restructuring and debt forgiveness and regulatory capital loss absorption. So uh, Pillar 1 uh, begins with a five to seven year uh, public investment program, uh, again in basic transportation, energy, communications, water treatment, and so forth, uh, infrastructure. The basic uh, plan or, or, or hope here is with uh, one point, and the paper, by the way, backs up the numbers, um, so pardon the, uh, the kind of quick and dirty treatment of the, of the numbers. Uh, but the target uh, would be, again, $1.2 trillion of additional public-private investment, uh, and then the consequent creation uh, of an additional uh, uh, 5.2 million plus jobs in each year uh, of the five-year uh, program. Again, we can give you the sources for the numbers uh, if you like. Uh, there'll be an emphasis, of course, on high uh, return investments in energy, transportation, <coughs> communications to eliminate economic bottlenecks and restore uh, productivity. <coughs> I guess I have to pick up the, uh, the pace a bit. Uh, also, creation of a national infrastructure bank uh, to, uh, to help out in that. Um, all right, I think I'm going to uh, maybe slide over quickly uh, more of the details of uh, Pillar 1 since I'm told to pick up the pace here. Um, everything else actually that I had is more or less uh, repetitive. Uh, maybe just two quick uh, uh, final points on, on Pillar 1 and then we'll move on to, to Pillar 2. Uh, these two points are as follows. First uh, is uh, in another project, another paper uh, that we're doing for the New America Foundation, we've actually run uh, the public investment numbers through uh, a widely respected macroeconomic model uh, put up on the web by uh, Ray Fair uh, over at Yale. Uh, and maybe not surprisingly, uh, it turns out uh, that this sort of program, 1.2 uh, trillion in, in public investment in infrastructure, would be significantly self-financing uh, owing to the multiplier effects and, and hence the consequent effects on employment and, and tax revenues. Um, that's the first point. Uh, second point uh, is that uh, it will never be cheaper in all likelihood uh, to undertake these investment projects and given that there seems to be widespread agreement, even among those who are skeptical about public investment in general, that these are going to have to be done at some time, right? Now that we've sunk to uh, 16th worldwide in the quality of our public infrastructure, and given all of the private costs to the private economy 
of bottlenecks and other forms of inefficiency that are generated by deteriorating public uh, infrastructure. Given all that, and given that therefore there's no doubt but that these projects are going to be undertaken at some point, it, may, it would be nothing less, we argue, than uh, financially irrational not to undertake them now, given how much less expensive it is to undertake them now than it will in future, with capital costs historically low, with labor costs historically low, with materials lost costs uh, historically low, uh, and so forth. That's the, uh, the, the second point. Um, all right, with that, I guess I'll turn over a pillar two uh, to Dan. Yeah, yeah uh, just a, a small commercial. We're in Washington, right? And half the people in this room are sitting here saying, what are you, nuts? Nothing like this is ever going to happen in this town. Uh, we're, we're here to tell you what it is we believe should be done. Uh, what gets done in America is a factor, generally speaking, of fear. Uh, and uh, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're, as long as we're able to sort of keep the, uh, the, the, the situation from completely declining, uh, we, we would agree that this is not the kind of climate in which to get these things done. However, uh, Nuriel will tell us a little bit about why we shouldn't be so complacent uh, <laughs> about, about the, the situation continuing as it is. So um, we, uh, we, we wrote a, a pillar two, which I'll whip through pretty quickly. Uh, it, it really it comes down to the issue of, of restructuring all the bad debt. Uh, you know, you can obviously grow your way out of the debt, that's great. Uh, you can try to increase savings, that's a possibility too. You could create unex unexpected inflation to devalue the debt. Uh, but as a practical matter, we believe we're way past that and we do need to deal with, especially with the enormous shadow inventory coming down the pike in housing and being liquidated, we're going to need to confront the, 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 the need to actually uh, restructure the debt. And uh, you know, my background comes from restructuring so that this is an area that I'm pretty comfortable with and, and I think was one of the reasons that we, uh, we sat down and did this. But look, in, in, I'm not gonna go through this in, in gory detail because the appendix to the report, which you can all pick up in the hall, uh, really works uh, through all of the details of what we, what we have in mind. The key to what we really advanced here was the notion of minimizing uh, moral hazard. Now, clearly if you run around handing out, you know, dropping money from helicopters and, and handing out money for free to people, they're gonna be incented to do the same thing over and over again. And so what we try to do is come up with a number of things that really weigh the economic benefits relative to the obvious moral hazard of writing off or, 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 or uh, uh, restructuring debt. And we came up with three levels of, uh, of, of debt restructuring for housing. One, which was focused on bridge loans for existing mortgagors who really have interim payment distress. The second, uh, contingent principal reduction, basically, if you make payments at this lower rate after 12 months, uh, we will actually slice your principal off, but we're not giving it to you until you show that you're gonna perform. And then finally, there are people who are going to just need to hand their deeds over. This liquidation process is incredibly expensive. Recoveries for non-GSE mortgages are averaging at 40 cents on the dollar through liquidation. Uh, that, is, that is a ridiculous hit when some of these borrowers can be saved by merely taking their loan over and renting them back their house and not having to have that house enter the market to further depress prices. So we, we spent a lot of time on that. There's a lot of detail. And I am going to uh, move beyond that because I'll mention one more point and then we'll move on to Nuriel. Uh, and that is that uh, uh, in order to make that work, you need to be realistic about how you're going to finance it. And so we've suggested a couple of things uh, with regard to how we handle it on the other end, one of which is the phased in recognition of losses. Uh, if you want to uh, tank your banking system tomorrow, and it would tank, you would just simply tell your banks to mark all of their portfolio loans, forget about the securities, to the market value of the underlying collateral. There'd be no equity, <coughs> right? And so you do need to have some way of avoiding having to either nationalize or restructure or take bank holding companies through bankruptcy or all sorts of other ideas that are out there. Uh, you know, if you want to uh, maintain the existing institutions, not necessarily for the benefit of their shareholders, but certainly for the benefit of their creditors. Uh, and so what we've suggested that, uh, that, that, we, that, that policy focus on is something similar to what happened in the 1980s when we had the Latin American debt crisis. Uh, where banks were able to effectively escrow their losses and recognize them over a period of time, provided they didn't fall below positive capital or sufficient positive capital. So that, that's another thing that we uh, map out in detail. 
And then finally, we spent a little bit of time dealing with these huge roadblocks. I know there are a few folks from, from Treasury who I thought was, I don't, I don't see them out there right now, but um, they, they were saying they were gonna come. I've spoken uh, with them a lot about this subject. This issue of uh, first mortgagees not being able to modify and compromise and, and deal with borrowers on a straight up basis simply because the borrower has this little thing called a HELOC or a home equity line of credit that is in second position behind his first mortgage and he's still paying that loan because that's his credit card, okay? And the payment's rather small. And what the first mortgagees have gone and done through the American Securization Forum here in Washington, they've gone to the major banks that hold these HELOCs and they've said, listen, we're willing to give this borrower a 20 cent slice off their mortgage and try to keep him in his house. He's not paying us, by the way, he's paying his HELOC. Uh, and uh, we'd like to keep, we'd like to try to resuscitate that mortgage and the banks turn back and say, the hell you do we are not giving any principal write down on our HELOC, which would mean effectively any principal write down that the, that the first mortgage would be giving would be handed over to the, uh, to the HELOC holder. And so consequently, those are things that, need, that can be worked out through policy, that can be worked out very adequately through regulatory policy. There just needs to be an awareness in this town of the, uh, of the effects of that on the overall market. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to, uh, to Nuriel, who's gonna discuss the global issues that uh, were the third pillar in our uh, in our uh, uh, paper, and thanks very much. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, you know the the problem of the United States, uh, you know, releveraging of the private sector, of course, is part of what was going on in the global economy. So I want to give you a bit of a context of how this is a more of a global picture. And if I had to describe the global economy for the last ten to twenty years. I would say that it was divided between two groups of countries. One was a group of countries that I would define as the consumers of first and last resort, uh, spending more than their income and running ever larger trade and current account deficits. And then on the other side of the world, you had the uh, countries where the producer of first and last resort uh, spending less than their income and running ever larger uh, trade and current account surpluses. And in the second group, I include uh, China, most uh, emerging Asia, and other emerging markets, but also a number of the advanced economies, you know, Germany and the core of the Eurozone and Japan. And in the former group, the one of the overspending countries, of course, uh, we had uh, two sets of countries. One was not just the United States, but also other countries in which you had a housing bubble. Uh, think about the US, but also the United Kingdom, Iceland and within the Eurozone countries like Spain and Ireland. So that excess of spending led to a build up of private debt, essentially debt of the household sector in all of these countries. So what happened in the US with the housing bubble had the mirror, you know, also in UK, Ireland, Iceland, Spain and Ireland and you name it. But then you had also a bunch of other countries in the periphery of the Eurozone where the build up of uh, debt was not in the private sector mostly, but rather in the public sector. Greece, uh, Portugal, and Italy. And now, uh, if you had to go to, let's say, to explanation, I would say, of what, what was going on in this global economy, I think that um, these uh, imbalances, in part, as pointed out by Dan and by our analysis, were driven by this increase in income and wealth inequality that occurred around the world. Essentially, for a long period of time, uh, wage growth and real income growth in uh, most advanced economies was anemic. You can discuss how much of it was uh, technology, international trade, uh, uh, labor, uh, skill bias, uh, technological change. But essentially to keep up with the Joneses, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon country we decided to democratize credit. That happened in US, UK, in Spain, in Ireland and so on. So you had a huge massive build up of uh, private debt. Uh, mortgages using your home's ATM machine, uh, you know, personal debt, credit cards, uh, student loans, you name it. While in the kind of uh, social welfare states of the Eurozone, especially the periphery, <coughs> instead of the democratization of credit that led to a build up of massive amount of uh, private debt, you had the increase in public debt. So you decide to finance with public debt, social services, education, healthcare, and others that people could not afford. Um, and therefore, in one group of countries, you had to build up first of private debt. In the other country, build up of public debt. But of course, when the housing bubble went bust, we had to socialize these losses, or we decided to socialize the losses of households of the financial system. So private debt became public debt. So the end result was the same, a huge amount of public debt in a variety of advanced economies. 
Now, starting with this uh, situation of imbalances where you have now large stocks of private and public debts in a number of advanced economies, and you have also still these large imbalances, uh, current account and now fiscal, the question is how you address uh, these imbalances and you return to economic growth. Of course, in principle, uh, the right solution will be the following one. There'll be a painful process of deleveraging in all the countries that were overspending, overspending in the private and or in the public sector. They have to spend less uh, in the private and public sector to save more or to save less to reduce debt and leverage uh, over time, assuming that you're not gonna have debt restructuring because in some cases the debt levels are so large that we're gonna need restructuring of debt of the private sector like mortgages or even of the public sector. But if domestic demand is gonna be weak in these uh, economies that are going through a painful process of deleveraging, the way to avoid the hard landing, double deep recession, a permanent stagnation is that there has to be an improvement of their net exports. That's going to be the source of going back to potential growth. And how you're going to get that uh, improvement in net exports? Of course, you need a nominal and a real depreciation in these countries that have uh, had excess of spending, so that as domestic demand is weak in the private and public sector, net exports are going to improve and therefore you're going to get back to growth. Now, in the over-saving countries, where consumption was weak, saving was high, and net exports were high, of course, if they have to, have to accept a reduction in their net exports through a nominal and a real uh, depreciation of their currencies, you know, in China, in Japan, in Germany, in other parts of the world, in emerging markets, the way to achieve and maintain their potential growth, of course, implies having the kind of structural reforms that are gonna to lead to save less and consume more. And especially in China and emerging Asia, there are lots of policies that we discuss that will lead to an increase essentially in consumption and reduction of savings because their growth model was biased towards net exports. So that's the global rebalancing that occurs. And therefore, the important point to make here is that people think about the imbalance between the US and China, this chimerical relationship between US, China, and emerging market, but the similar kind of imbalance did occur within the Eurozone where the core was running large current account surpluses and the periphery was running large current account deficits. And you had the same system of vendor financing that occurs in the, between US and China and emerging market also occurring within the Eurozone. Now, the crisis led now to a situation in which these imbalances are unsustainable. Now, within the Eurozone, the adjustment process is complicated by the fact that you have a common currency, right? You need a real depreciation in the periphery country, and you need a real appreciation in the core to have an adjustment of the trade balances. Because you have both a stock problem, too much debt, private and public, in the periphery, but you also have a stock a flow problem, lack of economic growth, lack of competitiveness, as there was massive real appreciation in the periphery, and large external balances. And these external balances are not anymore financeable because the private sector decided to pull the plug. There has been a sudden stop, and therefore the current account deficits of the periphery of the Eurozone cannot be financed anymore. In the US-China relationship, those current account imbalances are still financeable because China and the other emerging market have decided not to pull the plug on the financing of the large US current account deficits. But in the case of the Eurozone, there is also a problem of financing, not just a problem of real, real, real adjustment. Now, the trouble within the Eurozone is that you have these stock problems, excessive amounts of private and public debt. You have the flow problems, lack of growth, lack of competitiveness, large external imbalances, and the adjustment that the core German and the ECB is imposing on the periphery is essentially one that's gonna lead not just to recession, but to depression. Because while fiscal austerity is necessary, while structural reforms are necessary, in the short run, that austerity is gonna make the recession worse. You have to raise taxes, you have to cut government spending, you have to reduce transfer payments, those reduce <coughs> aggregate demand, they reduce disposable income and make the recession worse. And even the structural reforms in the short run make the recession worse. You have to fire private and public employees, you have to shut down thousands of unprofitable firms, you have to move labor and capital from declining sector to expanding sector. And what are the expanding sector in which you have a comparative advantage unless you have a change in real exchange rates? 
So the point is that right now there is an asymmetric adjustment that is deflationary and recessionary in the periphery of the Eurozone and it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work because if output is gonna keep on falling, first there's gonna be a social and political backlash against the austerity. Secondly, you're trying to stabilize private and public debts, domestic and foreign, as a share of your GDP. If your GDP keeps on falling, your debt ratio becomes unsustainable. And the same thing with deflation. Uh, first of all, deflation is going to be associated with more recession, and even if you could reduce prices and wages by, say, 30% over the next five years to restore your competitiveness, then the real value of your debt is going to go up. So you get the process of debt deflation becoming exacerbated. So in the Eurozone, you don't have only a problem of financing. The financing of these imbalances is not there anymore. There's been a sudden stop, and unless you have a recycling through the official sector, of the surpluses of the core to finance the deficits of the periphery, then you'll have a, essentially a disaster, default. But you have also an adjustment problem, not just financing, because you cannot maintain these external imbalances forever. The adjustment implies that the deficits of the periphery have to shrink to zero, and the surpluses of the core have to shrink to zero. But for that to happen, you need a real depreciation. And the way that can happen or should happen is through a massive devaluation of the euro. Should fall towards parity with the US dollar in order to restore the competence of the periphery. Because deflation is not going to work. And if you're not going to have a depreciation of the euro, then the only other option is exit from the eurozone with all the collateral damage that that exit of the eurozone, a breakup of the eurozone, is going to occur. So that's, that's the challenge that you're facing both adjustment on the real side and financing and dealing with debt levels that are unsustainable. And in my view, unfortunately, eventually restructuring of private and public debts of the governments, of the financial system, in a number of these periphery countries, the Eurozone is gonna become necessary and avoidable. Even that's gonna deal only with a stock problem, not with a flow problem. And therefore, to restore the competitiveness, you're gonna need maybe essentially exit of a number of member states. Now, if a small number of them exit a small Greece or Portugal, the Eurozone survives. If Italy and Spain, the third and the fourth largest economy in Eurozone, exit, that's the breakup of the Eurozone. And that's one of the risks we're facing right now. Now, in the case of the United States imbalances relative to China and emerging market, the financing is still there. Uh, these emerging markets, starting with China, are still willing to intervene aggressively to prevent their currency from appreciating and therefore finance the imbalance. The problem is that the imbalances are maintained and the US to restore potential growth with domestic demand being anemic for the years to come because there's gonna be a deleverage in the private and public sector is gonna to need to have a real depreciation of the US dollar. China is shadowing the US dollar, letting small appreciation, everybody else in emerging markets from Asia to Latin America says, if China doesn't move, I don't want to let my currency appreciate because I'm going to lose competitiveness and market shares to China. And therefore, that adjustment of relative prices that should occur to rebalance also the imbalances between US and China and emerging market is blocked. For now, the financing is there, but that situation, of course, is unsustainable and is not going to restore economic growth in the United States. So the point is, Behind all this accumulation of private and public debt, there are global imbalances. You need an adjustment of these imbalances to reduce them, but those implies sacrifices and policy changes both in the overspending country and the oversaving ones that are being postponed, and we're not allowing the adjustment of relative prices. On the fiscal side, by the way, the critical point is the following one. In a world economy in which there is not enough aggregate demand, in which there is excess supply because of the overinvestment by China and emerging markets, we have a problem of global aggregate demand, right? And therefore, if everybody is going to go along the path of fiscal austerity, as even the IMF and Lagarde have pointed out recently, if the US is going to do front-order <laughs> front fiscal austerity, if the core of the Eurozone, if the periphery of the Eurozone, if the UK, if uh, Japan is going to be doing it in a world in which there is not enough aggregate demand, the problem is going to become exacerbated. So if the markets are imposing necessary fiscal austerity on the periphery of the Eurozone, where you have lost market access, so there is no choice for Italy, Spain, Ireland, Portugal, Greece to do the fiscal austerity, in order to prevent a risk of a severe hard landing in the Eurozone and globally, the countries who can borrow cheaply 
should be actually doing fiscal expansion in the short run and postpone the fiscal austerity in a credible way to the medium term. And of all the forms of fiscal stimulus that we can think of, for the case of the United States, investing in infrastructure, we point out, is the most productive and efficient one. And you could make the same argument in other parts of the world. There should be a postponement rather than a front loading of the fiscal austerity and try to find the forms of fiscal expansion as long as you have a credible plan towards medium term fiscal consolidation to have a situation which domestic demand and, uh, is maintained so that you don't have this glut of supply with a lack of aggregate demand. So that's the kind of conundrum that we're facing right now. So there is a need for adjustment of the imbalances. There is a need of financing for countries that have lost market access. Those are the Eurozone countries, but globally, there are some emerging markets that are weak. There is the MENA region that is weak and so on. So financing has to be made available. We have to recycle the surpluses of the surplus country. We have to make more funding available to the international community, not just to finance the imbalances of the periphery of the Eurozone, but increasingly we're gonna to need to finance also crises in emerging markets, crises in the Middle East. That's our part of the proposal of increasing the envelope of global resources available. You can do it in a number of ways, increasing IMF resources, uh, more quotas, more NABs, lending bilateral by surplus countries, and sovereign countries to the IMF or other facilities to be able to provide a larger envelope of official resources. You could do it through issuance of SDRs. There are many different ways of doing this, but we have a need for financing globally, given the imbalances and given the fact that if adjustment occurs suddenly, then that's recessionary. But we cannot just finance imbalances. Over time, we have to have a shrinkage of those imbalances, but shrinkage of those imbalances in a way that is consistent with economic growth. If the current account deficit of the peripheral Eurozone goes to zero because you have a depression in the Eurozone, that's not an adjustment that is feasible. You want an adjustment in which they go to zero to a change in relative prices to a nominal and a real depreciation. So those are the fundamental key issues they need globally. Adjustment of the global imbalances, financing to make that adjustment more gradual and more sustainable with maintenance of economic growth in the different regions of the world. N and that's Nurio. part of our policy proposals. Yeah, thank, thanks, Nerio. Uh, I, th I think the, the uh, bottom line of what Nerio was saying was very important, that we still have a long and very difficult challenge ahead of us. I, I want to now bring in and expand the conversation by bringing uh, three additional voices into our discussion and conversation. Uh, each of them will uh, add their own comments and thoughts uh, in six to eight minutes, beginning with Leah Cott and then Bruce Bartlett and Leo Hendry. Uh, Leah Cott. Great, thank you. Um, does this work? Okay. Well, first of all, let me say that I think this is a brilliant paper. I agree with almost everything in it. Um, uh, I mean, I agree with the diagnosis of how we got into this mess, uh, the prescriptions of what we should do now. Uh, the problem, of course, is that two of the three pillars require Congress to spend a very large amount of money, and the third pillar requires other countries uh, to do the right thing in a way that they don't seem to want to do at the moment. So uh, I've been asking myself, is there a plan B? Um, and here I think the authors are just um, are too negative um, about the potential for, um, uh, for monetary policy. Um, and I really draw that because uh, of my knowledge of what happened in the 1930s. So what I'd like to do is just spend a little time talking about the recovery of the 1930s. The 2933 uh, depression was remarkably similar. Uh, the lead up, you had an imbalance, you had bubbles. Uh, the bubble bursting led to a uh, domestic banking crisis and led to a combination of a banking and sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Uh, the response has been somewhat different. There, they truly uh, killed the patient. We just we kept the patient alive without. Um, uh, without getting it back to health. 
but then after 1933, or in fact earlier if you take Europe, after 1931 in the case of the UK, you began to get a substantial recovery. Uh, so contrary to what a lot of conservatives say, the, the 1930s was actually a period of very strong growth. Uh, in the eight years from 1933 to 1940, five of those eight years you had over 8% growth. Uh, industrial production doubled in the four years from 1933 to 1936. Uh, secondly, that recovery had almost nothing to do with fiscal policy. Uh, the, the New Deal was a lot of things, but it was not an expansionary Keynesian type fiscal policy. Uh, Roosevelt was actually really quite conservative on fiscal policy. Uh, the, the federal budget deficit expanded somewhat, that was offset. Uh, expenditures rose somewhat, that was offset by increases in taxes. Um, and by curtailments at the state level. So what got the economy going? It was essentially a global monetary easing of gigantic proportions. And it essentially occurred because they left the gold standard. Um, and what that did with a stroke of a pen uh, was do two th three things. Completely reliquified the banking system because suddenly all this gold was worth 100% uh, more. Uh, secondly, changed inflationary expectations or changed ex expectations from deflation to uh, inflation um, and got spending going again and got, raised asset prices and got spending going again. Uh, that is very similar to what QE2 was trying to do. Um, and uh, I suppose my, you know, my response to Dan, Dan's point on QE2 is, I think, you know, we're, we're making an assessment based on a very short period of time, based on a very short exper experiment in monetary easing. Uh, there were, during the 30s, there were three criticisms of this whole um, getting off the gold standard and gigantic monetary reflation. Uh, the first was that uh, the US, by doing it, was sort of uh, exerting a predatory influence on the rest of the world. And that was in part true because the US was running a very large surplus at the time. So the US devaluing in 1933 was, would be a little bit like China devaluing now. Uh, the difference now is that the US easing in a very substantial way um, and devaluing would be promoting global rebalance, not hindering it. Um, secondly, the argument was that um, it led to competitive devaluations. Uh, my view is that competitive devaluations have a very bad press. Competitive devaluations are, is another name for competitive easing of monetary policy. Um, the third prob, uh, criticism is that uh, the, sort of the, the competitive devaluations led to a climate of sort of retreat from globalization, countries protecting themselves by hunkering, uh, hunkering down behind tariffs and capital controls. Um, and you, you, you basically got it was the worst form of nationalism and uh, populism. I think the world is a very different place now. Uh, the, uh, the forces that go for, I mean, the striking thing about this last uh, this last three years is the dog that hasn't barked is protectionism. We've had very modest increases in protectionism. Um, and the question, why not? And, the, and it seems to me, one, by and large, we have money, we, exchange rates are largely flexible. Uh, the reason we got severe protectionism in the 1930s and the biggest increases in protectionism was with countries that refused to change their exchange rate. So the most protectionist country was Germany because it refused to change its exchange rate and had to do everything through import controls. Now we have a group of countries that by and large are willing to, uh, that have floating exchange rates. And those that are unwilling to change their exchange rate are essentially currently surplus countries. 
who have a very strong vested interest in an open trading system. Uh, so if anything, I, I would make a plea as a plan B for aggressive Fed easing. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Bruce. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, I don't disagree with anything that any of the previous speakers have said, so let me just put a little bit of a different emphasis on a few points. I'd like to call attention to uh, figure four in the paper. That's the one uh, household net worth. Because uh, I think this is really central to understanding the whole uh, economic problem that we have. As you can see, the uh, net worth reached something like $70 trillion before the crash and fell to close to $50 trillion. $20 trillion of wealth just disappeared. Now this is extraordinarily important for macroeconomic purposes because we know from uh, a great many studies that there is a wealth effect, that people will spend a certain amount of any perceived increase in wealth. Uh, there's some debate about how much this is, but we'll say it's about 5% uh, for the sake of argument. So uh, a $20 trillion drop in, Nash in net wealth is going to take something like $1 trillion a year out of spending in the economy. And that is a sufficient explanation for every single thing that has happened. Now the question is, what do you do about it? Uh, you can't uh, create wealth out of, out of nothing. You don't want to create another bubble just for the purposes of getting people to spend. What you have to do is, is, uh, is the government has to step in to keep spending up. Uh, basically, it's just very simple uh, Keynesian economics. And, and I think that uh, we could have done, uh, filled that gap with the kind of public works programs that, that the paper talks about. God knows we have a tremendous need for rebuilding roads and bridges and schools and, and, and a wide variety of things. And if we could borrow at zero percent, I don't. The, the social rate of return has to be uh, considerably higher. I think we will look back years from now at, at this being a tremendously lost opportunity to take advantage of, of, of excess uh, capacity in the economy. Now. Where I think uh, uh, we got off on the, the wrong track, and, and by the way, I, I wrote up a, a, an article pretty much explaining all of this in, in the New York Times in January uh, or December of 2008. The problem was that it appeared on December 24, so absolutely nobody <laughs> read it. Uh, but, but anyway, I, I, what I was trying to put forward is that, is that the, the, the new administration needed to have a theory and, and I had some association with the Reagan administration, and I think a lot of their political uh, success came from the fact that they had a theory. You can argue with it, you may say it was a crackpot theory, but they had a theory that, that fit their policies. And so, uh, and, and I think that part of the problem is this administration has never had a theory of how we got into this mess, and therefore there's never been any connection between, uh, to its policies that, that people could understand. And, uh, and I don't know why they never did this, uh, but uh, all we ever really got was that one paper that Christy Romer and uh, Jared Bernstein put out in January of 2009 uh, that had the famous unemployment chart that, that, that now makes the administration look rather silly. But, uh, the, the point, but, but everything in that paper was more or less correct, except that the numbers were all too low. Uh, we now know uh, from, from various uh, reportage that uh, uh, the, the Council of Economic Advisors, and, and Christy Romer in particular, were, were looking for a stimulus package in the, in the, in the neighborhood of one and a half trillion dollars to, to fill the gap of, of lower spending that, that, was, uh, that, uh, that needed to be filled uh, to, to get us over the hump. And what came back, of course, was $787 billion uh, because the political people said that's the most we're ever going to get out of Congress. And they were probably right. But it was half of what we needed. So, so uh, to, 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 to make an analogy, suppose you had some illness and you went to the doctor for, a medicine, for the, the correct medicine and for some reason or another he gave you half the dosage that was necessary. 
the half the dosage was just enough to kind of diminish the symptoms a little bit, but it wasn't enough to cure you. You needed to get a full dose of the medicine, and until you do, you're still going to be sick. And, and that's basically the problem we've had. We've never gotten a full dose of the medicine, and, and we're certainly not going to get it today. Uh, another part of the problem with the, the stimulus is, the, is that a, a great deal of it went into, uh, was, was of a form that was of absolutely no value. Uh, and in particular, the tax cuts were a complete waste of money. And that took up something like 40% of the, of the budgetary cost of the package. Now, why Obama put all so many of his eggs into a basket, this one basket that his advisor certainly knew uh, was not a, of any great value, I don't know. I can only assume that he was looking to buy Republican votes, which was stupid. They were never going to vote for this package, uh, no matter what was in it. And, uh, and, 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 uh, so, and so anyway, uh, the, the problem was the package was too small. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was not properly structured. Uh, virtually little, very little, maybe somebody knows the precise proportions, but a, a very small proportion of the money went into direct spending, that is to say public works, hiring workers, uh, uh, taking uh, purchases of goods and services. That's where all the stimulus comes from. All this other income transfer stuff has no value. Uh, so, uh, and, and let me say another thing about uh, the uh, about Federal Reserve policy. Now, when you take something like a trillion dollars of spending out of the economy, what happens is the velocity of money falls. The velocity of money is simply the, uh, uh, the money supply divided, or the GDP divided by the money supply. And normally it's about 1.9. Uh, but, but because people cut back so much in their spending, it fell to something like 1.7. So that's exactly the has exactly the same identical economic effects as a shrinkage of the money supply by 10 percent. And what we know about the Great Depression these days, uh, mostly from Milton Friedman's work, is that the main cause of all our problems was that the money supply shrank by about a third, and this caused uh, a, a pri the price level to fall by about 25 percent. And what we needed all along was for the Fed to just pump up the money supply, and it didn't do it. And we have the same problem today. The Fed needed to, to, to fill that gap. But the problem is, at, at the zero bound, the, the, the Fed normally operates through interest rates. But when interest rates reach zero, they can't do any more. You've got a barrier, a floor, through which it cannot go. And, and at that point, you need to have fiscal policy to pull the money out into the economy and get it circulating. And so you had, so the failure of fiscal policy led to the failure of monetary policy. And now we're, and, and basically we're, we're still stuck in the same situation we were three years ago, and we haven't made any progress at all. Except that, the problem, except that our problems are much worse because of political reasons, because we now have a crazy party in charge of one of the houses of our Congress, and they won't allow anything to happen because it's in their vested interest to make things worse. And uh, plus they have a theory that is completely nuts. Uh, but uh, so, so anyway, uh, where we go from here, I think is... Uh, I, is, 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 I'm, I'm very, very depressed. I mean, I'd love to see some program like this enacted. I see zero chance of it happening. Uh, the most we can hope for is that a, a complete crazy person like Newt Gingrich gets the Republican nomination. The Republicans lose so badly that they lose control of the House and don't get control of the Senate. And then maybe in a year, we can finally talk about doing something rational, such as what is discussed in this paper. Thanks. You have the floor, Leo. Uh, when, when Joe Nacera uh, describes the paper as the most clear-eyed view he's uh, ever seen, uh, and Lequat uh, is pretty enthusiastic, I'm, I'm wildly enthusiastic. Let me uh, make one comment about the paper and then uh, perhaps in, in the form of amplification uh, address the paper. The only place in the paper itself that I, I thought uh, you, you missed a, a bit of a point was the, the staging of the in, the, in the global rebalancing, you, you seem to imply that there was needed to be a staging between the European side and the Asian or Chinese side. I, I think the magnitude uh, of, of the problem has, has obviated that. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was literally the only textual change I would have made. In, in terms of, of adding to it, uh, I, I do think the paper would have been advantaged by 
dwelling more, and I know that you, you're space limited, but the, the imperative of a national manufacturing policy. Uh, we, we continue to be the only one of the nations that are addressed in the paper that doesn't have one. And, and I don't find a solution for our predicament sh short of one. Uh, it, it, it comes up, Dan, in, in some of your earlier comments about uh, you know the, the quality of employment in the United States. But I think that it, it had the paper uh, moved more specifically in, into the imperative for our own national manufacturing policy. Is as the women and men in the room know we're at about eight or nine percent, and every surviving nation is closer to twenty or twenty-five percent. Uh, the, the one piece that we're very enthusiastic about, we became such all the way back in, in 06, when we saw from the domestic perspective the degradation of employment that Dan alluded to, uh, we think the solution somewhat to where Bruce was trying to take you and, and certainly Lee Quad as well, is the bank. Uh, the bank at, at 1.2 trillion of, of capability is short, in my opinion, at least 800 billion. Uh, I think it needs to be in, in the two trillion range and, and how we get there is our multiplier effects off of the expenditures are not as fulsome as yours, they're, they're, they're good, they're, they're just not as fulsome as yours. Uh, I think a, a solution to how you might jump from 1.2 trillion to 1.2 tr trillion to 2 trillion uh, is an involvement of the pension community, uh, the, the markets, the aging population, uh, of the pension beneficiaries, the difficulties they have in, in, in achieving rates of return that, that will meet those expectations. We've spent a lot of time, uh, Don Regal and Alan Platt, Pat Malloy and I are, are sitting down there with the uh, state pension community, the larger states, and I think uh, that might be a, 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 a place to plug it. The one thing that I would do uh, more of is, I, rather than sort of tax strategies in the paper, and I think uh, they were sensitive and, and, and very, very appropriate, I haven't had the privilege. Uh, Bruce just handed me his new book on, on fundamental tax reform, uh, but I think the, the paper at least has to lay out some prescription that's more elaborative of, of fundamental tax reform. I, Bruce, maybe when we get back, you could jump in a bit on this, but uh, it's it's far past a economic issue, it's a moral issue. You, you do a nice job, and, and I am very grateful for the job you did on income inequality, uh, but the, 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 the resuscitation of the economy, uh, the obviation of the income inequality is going to be a function of very dramatic tax reform, and uh, I, I, like everybody else, are anxious to read Bruce's new book on that. Uh, the, the last situation that I would have stuck right, right alongside the bank are special employment initiatives. Uh, we have dug some holes for women and men over the age of 50 and for the out-of-school unemployed youth that are both, they're, they're simply unprecedented. And while the bank would address the core unemployment issue, I think respectfully and well, uh, I don't see it being a particular opportunity for these two aggrieved groups. Uh, women and men of color uh, are overrepresented in both of them, but we have about five million out of school unemployed youth that won't be a beneficiary of either Bruce's tax reforms or of the bank. And uh, Don Regal, better than anybody I know, has written about the predicament of the over 50 uh, underemployed, unemployed, part-time of necessity uh, worker. Uh, that bank, again, will do nothing for that. Uh, the, the last comment has to be China, China, China. Uh, I'm, I'm numb that this administration has wasted three years of diplomacy. Uh, Pat Malloy on the China Commission has done an amazing piece of work as, as the whole commission. It, it's, it's the lost years. Uh, it's just stunning. Uh, we need them. Uh, you fellows who wrote the paper uh, to be part of this exercise. We've now uh, been so ineffective, so so passive, so tepid uh, that they don't believe us. I think we've, uh, Cheryl, I think we're looking at a full year now before they'll readdress our needs because they don't believe us. And and the election is, is going to be their excuse not to believe us for yet another year. So thank you. I, amazing paper. I think Joe's comments were, were right on. And, uh, Bruce, you might, I got a minute left on my time if you have anything to offer on uh, tax reform. 
Well, I just want to say that thanks for the uh, for the plug. I'll be making a payment to the uh, Cayman <laughs> account that you and I discussed earlier. Uh, the book will be out in January, by the way. Uh, Leo, you kept referring to we. I think you met your task force. Do you want to just say a word about yeah, I, that? I, that? That was because I, that, I, that's, I, well, I that also has a New America connection. Well, I, think. I, I do, and I sure you're right. I uh, we. Uh, is more than just the royal we. We is is 20 of the most amazing women and men that I've ever had the privilege of working with. Don Regal, Alan Platt, Pat Malloy, Cheryl, Mike Lind uh, were certainly part of it. We, we formed a, a, a task force on jobs under New America uh, that put out, a, I think, a pretty attractive piece of work uh, about uh, six weeks ago. A couple of us will be in Ohio Iowa tomorrow. Uh, rolling it out there and in Ohio uh, later uh, in the cycle. Uh, it's it's just a, a belief that if, if there is Lee Quat and, and, and Bruce, if there's any hope for nonpartisan, bipartisan initiatives, these were, these were PAYGO provisions. Cheryl was a big part of that aspect of it. Uh, we actually found through tax initiatives that we could pay for the creation of roughly 20 million jobs over seven years. Uh, which is kind of the hole we have to dig out of. So thanks, Cheryl. I apologize for that. It's called Task Force on Task Force on Jobs, and then uh, uh, Jobs First 2012. And again, uh, these folks here at New America were uh, real angels in helping us put that together. Leo Gerard and, and Don Regal were co-chairs. Yes. Yeah, so if any of you want a copy of that report, you can can write to uh, Sam Shradden at New America Shradden at NewAmerica.net. And, and Sam, uh, who largely responsible for everything that goes on in New America, will we'll make sure you get that that re report. I was originally going to give work the um, original speakers back in, but we're we we have about 30, 35 minutes, so I, I did want to uh, move the. I know Dean Baker is anxious to ask a question, <laughs> <laughs> and there there are others who have comments, and so. Uh, uh, I, I think the only point that at some point uh, uh, Dan and Nuriel and Bob will perhaps have to say a few things in response to Leoquat's uh, Plan B, uh, and that was 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 a, a major point of discussion and debate with, within with, within the group. But let's get a few questions, and then we'll go back to Plan B. <laughs> uh, uh, Dean. I had raised my hand, so that how Sharon did that. But, uh, just, uh, I really appreciate it. First, Bruce, uh, with, with the graph, I mean, I really wish we could make everyone who spoke on economic policy remember the wealth effect. I mean, this was pretty basic. And, you know, I would just add also, we did lose about four percentage points of GDP in residential construction, going from two uh, six percent to two percent, it's about 600 billion a year. I'd also point out, there is something with the taxes. I mean, we beat up on that a lot. And we get somewhere around 50 to 70 cents on a dollar. So you don't get nothing from the taxes. But my real thing, I want to go with Dan. I think, you know, if we look at the politics as to why no one will make kind of these obvious points about the imbalances, I see a little bit different picture than you do. I mean, I recognize obviously there's a huge change in the world economy with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and Ch China coming into the, the world economy. But I really date this to, to 97, because if you look at the big imbalances, the U.S. trade deficit was somewhere around 1.5% one, one of GDP until 97. 97, of course, you got the East Asian financial crisis. The solution imposed by our Treasury Department through the IMF was that the currencies of East Asia fell through the floor and they were going to repay their debts by exporting like crazy. I see that as really being the origins of the major imbalances that we subsequently had to deal with. And this gets back to the political issue. The Obama people don't want to say anything because guess who did it? You know, so you have a problem that obviously the Republicans aren't going to raise this issue. And the Obama Democrats have no more reason people don't know. I mean, it's Larry Summers, Robert Rubin, that's who did it. So that really is the source of the imbalances. I, I see that as the momentous event, not so much the, which are of course important, but I see the imbalances coming directly from the East Asian financial crisis. Very, very interesting. First of all, I want to, I want to point out that, that Dean was the only one out there in the world in, in the third quarter of 2007 when I was a lonely guy trying to draft some things that everybody told me I was nuts about, and I emailed him and I said, you're the only one who's not crazy. Uh, could you look at some of my early work? And he was very, very uh, kind to, to respond. Uh, Dean really deserves, uh, along with Nuriel and several other people, uh, credit for being one of the earliest folks in this, uh, in this area who were, who were right. 
Um, in, in any event, uh, the, 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 we, we had a very interesting seminar as part of our, our World Economic Forum with uh, Yasheng Huang, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, who's a professor up at MIT. And one of the things that we talked about that day was um, uh, really what spurred uh, exactly what you were talking about. And, and I don't disagree, by the way, that the Asian uh, currency crisis had an enormous impact on it. But uh, what, I, what I drilled down on uh, with him, which I wanted to make sure he uh, was, what I heard was I heard correctly, so I asked him a question a couple of different ways. You know, uh, people look back at the fall of the, the Iron Curtain and the Bamboo Curtain and they say, okay, well, let's draw a line. The Berlin Wall fell in 1989. That seems like a convenient point. Tiananmen was 1989. Seems like a convenient point to sort of start things. There's another school of Sinophiles who look at uh, China and they say, well, this all really began in the 1985 five-year plan and it was uh, the need to, to boost um, uh, urban development as opposed to the agricultural reforms that had, had succeeded pretty well up till then. Uh, and uh, so what I asked the professor, which I thought was, was very interesting, and it was really taking off on what he said, it wasn't really my question, but it, he, he said, listen, what really happened in China was uh, prior to the Asian currency crisis, really about 1991, 1989, as a response to, to Tiananmen and the, and the disruption that caused. Uh, was you had the uh, enormous uh, uh, resurgence or surgeons, I don't know, surgeons a word, whatever it is, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of the Shanghainese uh, 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 politicos, right? The folks that really run China today, uh, who advocated enormous urbanization and enormous de dedication to manufacturing and exports. Um, so to a certain extent, uh, and I, I said, listen, I asked the professor, I said, where would you peg this? He said, well, certainly, you know, the, the political uh, difficulty that occurred uh, as a result of Tiananmen was what caused this in the first place. He said, but by 1981, 1982, 1983, the die was cast. So, yes, I agree with Dean, that had, that had a lot to do with it. But China was moving on this uh, trajectory in any case. They had an interest, uh, even if the Asian tigers hadn't collapsed and the currencies hadn't collapsed, China had an interest in providing jobs for urbanizing population, and, uh, and, and they still do. And that's really what's driving the boat. Uh, Senator Rick. First of all, I want to thank everybody for the thoughts and what they've said today. If you take this forward, this is uh, <coughs> these trend lines, and there's pretty much a consensus here that well, there's, there's smart things we could be doing and should be doing, uh, they're probably not going to happen because of the political gridlock and what have you. I don't think that's an acceptable answer, even if that's the reality of the moment. So I think we've got to think outside that box, and I think we have to find a way over the next 12 months, uh, speaking in that period of time, not just thinking about the presidential race and, and shortly thereafter, to force a reassessment of, of where we're heading. Because what I didn't hear is where will we be in 12 months if, if nothing more is done? Or where will we be in 18 months? I mean, how long is the fuse, particularly if, uh, if Europe blows up in some form or some other event happens, uh, where are we likely to find ourselves if, if nothing major is done in this interim? And I, I think that's a risk we shouldn't run. And I think maybe the answer to it is we need to, we need to think our way to uh, some new leadership that, that isn't present on the scene right now. And I was thinking to myself, uh, business leadership. Now that may sound like an oxymoron because I don't see a lot of leadership out of the business community, the big overarching commu business community relates to this discussion. In other words, how to take this sort of roadmap or plan and roll it into place somehow in a matter of months uh, and not over a period of five to seven years. I mean. Uh, to get at it a lot faster than that because time isn't our friend. And I guess my point is this, and it's my question really, and that is can we find a way to take this intelligent thinking and argumentation to a group of stakeholders who, who really are, are, are not going to benefit if things start to cave in even more, and to get them energized with practical answers that can lead us to a national economic strategy for America. And that having a national economic strategy for the country is really a good thing. And companies, as they're pursuing their own individual uh, uh, objectives and EPS uh, goals and so forth, 
can also be part of being actively engaged in a bigger strategy. And if Obama can't produce it, uh, or didn't produce it in time three years ago, wasn't thinking that way, that doesn't mean we can't produce it. And we've got to enlist more people. And so I would ask you to think about how we take this conversation out of this room to a group of people who have power in, 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 in together in combination and start to force this change a whole lot faster than we're otherwise likely to get it. I've got three quick things I can say in response and then maybe the others as well. So uh, the first is, is that um, we think that uh, Bruce is spot on in saying that at least in the early years of the Obama administration, there just wasn't a theory as to how we got here, what went wrong. Uh, and hence, there wasn't really a theory by way of, uh, that one might offer by way of justifying any specific proposals, let alone a co coherently put together package of proposals. One of the things that the paper is meant to do is to sort of begin the process of supplying something in the way of a theory uh, that then can sort of articulate and sort of render coherent what otherwise might look like a, a sort of diffuse bunch of policy proposals and initiatives. That's the first point. Second point, uh, and sort of relatedly, uh, is we thought, well, it, we're not unmindful of the fact in writing this thing that we do have an election cycle uh, commencing. And we thought, well, perhaps we are offering here at least part of what might become the platform of some political party. Um, and then, <laughs> and then uh, finally, um, uh, thirdly, uh, we have sort of thought this is maybe a little bit sanguine. This is a sort of paradoxically sanguine sounding on the one hand and, and sort of Dr. Doom sounding on the other hand. Um, but the idea is, we, we've, we've, to some extent, we thought that really this is going to end up being a kind of self-recommended policy if our diagnosis is correct. Because if the diagnosis is correct, things are going to get pretty bad pretty fast pretty soon, right? Um, and if that happens, that might very well uh, have a galvanizing effect and might uh, induce some who are currently sort of still ideologically prompted uh, maybe to sort of abandon some of the ideology and to, and to sort of think more pragmatically again. And among, uh, I think maybe, maybe a fourth point is I think you're, you're singling out the business community in particular to sort of get behind this. Uh, is, is, is very much on our minds as well. I mean, and, and indeed, uh, we gave the sort of New York rollout presentation of this back in October. Uh, hordes of, uh, of investment bankers actually approached us and said, hey, we would like to get behind this. We'd like to actually, the, the, the only place you're going to find yield in, in the near term future probably is going to be in, in um, uh, infrastructure investment. We'd love to get behind this. Uh, and my guess is that if a sizable portion of the business community gets behind this, that might actually have an effect on uh, at least another party uh, who the paper might not otherwise affect. Uh, Bruce, you wanted to get in. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that I think the possibilities of doing anything positive over the next 12 months are non-existent completely, zero, nada. Uh, I think what we're going to. I think we're going to have to expend every ounce of resources that we have to prevent things from getting worse. By getting worse, I mean the adoption of negative policies that both parties seem to be inclined to uh, to adopt. You know, all you ever hear about these days is deficit reduction, deficit reduction. That's all we ever hear. And there's a little bit of, uh, of, of discussion around the margins as to how, how that should be done. And I would uh, remind people that, uh, that 75 years ago, we were probably having in the same identical room, the same identical discussion. And what happened? What happened is the, that across the street, Henry Morgenthau uh, talked to uh, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt into saying, we need to increase the confidence of the business community. And they are very upset by the budget deficit. If we balance the budget, this will increase confidence and growth will be restored. Well, that's what they did. And what happened? We had a big recession, 1936, 37, a terrible recession that set back our progress by several years. And that's what's in the cards. That's, what's, that's the most likely thing to happen, is that we'll do something to make things worse. Not that we're going to do something to make things better. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Marilyn G. Wex with NPR. Uh, for Professor Rubini, I just wondered if you could give us your best predictions for, in the next 24, 48 hours or so, what's likely to happen in Europe? I know you're fresh back from there. What do you see happening in the next couple of days, and what will be the uh, global market reactions, please? Uh, <clears throat> well, I would say that they're going to reach something of a compromise, uh, but the compromise is not going to be sufficient uh, in two dimensions. First, the envelope of official resources is not going to be as large as needed because uh, some people believe there will be a quid pro quo between uh, the periphery accepting uh, binding fiscal rules and the German accepting some form of e-bonds or mutualization of debt. Uh, the Germans are not yet ready for that. So that's not going to happen. Um, some people say there'll be 
addition of the ESM over the EFSF, even that's not sure it's going to happen. Probably if there'll be binding fiscal rules, uh, the ECB might do more, but the ECB is not going to become a full end of last resort. They'll do a little bit more of SMP, they're going to do a little bit more of uh, credit easing, but uh, the Eurozone is going into a recession, and the recession is getting, becoming deeper. Um, and the international community eventually might provide more resources. You know, there might be bilateral loans from the national central banks of the Eurozone to the IMF so they can be lent back to the IMF. There may be NABs, some more quotas, some SDRs. So the envelope of official resources is going to be larger, but not significant to backstop Italy, Spain, and the periphery of the next uh, three years. Uh, but more importantly, fiscal austerity and reforms, as I pointed out, are recessionary. So uh, right now the market is saying to Italy, Spain, and the others, cut uh, spending, raise taxes, have a primary surplus, balance budget, balance amendments, and gradually, uh, you know, these countries are doing it. But look what happened in Greece, where the recession is becoming more severe as they're doing massive fiscal austerity. And tomorrow, the markets in a month or two, they're going to sell uh, this country, good effort, kids, on the fiscal side, but guess what, your output is collapsing, your debt ratios are going to the roof, and therefore you're still insolvent, and then spreads are going to widen again, meaning unless you have a strategy in the Eurozone to restore growth, to restore competitiveness, to reduce the external imbalances, uh, and nothing else on the financing side is going to work, and I think that what's missing in the Eurozone right now is a strategy for economic growth that would imply massive monetary easing by the ECB, not just cutting rates, but QE, credit easing, lending of last resort support. You require a massive fall in the value of the euro towards parity of US dollar. And if the periphery is doing a recessionary austerity, then the core and Germany should do fiscal stimulus to try to avoid this severe recession, restore growth. And what's the joint probability? There'll be a massive monetary easing in the, by the ECB. There'll be fiscal stimulus in the core, and the euro is going to fall to parity and the ECB is going to become a full end of last resort, I would say the joint probability is zero, and therefore the recession in the Eurozone is going to become worse and worse, and eventually that's going to imply another panic and, and, and a disaster down the line. I, I, I want to bridge off of Bruce's comments that the chance of anything positive happening are uh, virtually non-existent, and also Nuriel's comments to come back to, to Lee Kwat's, uh Plan B and to get, um, in particular, Dan and, and, and Nuriel's uh, comments uh, in, in terms of what, um, of, of, of just um, how much we may be dependent on a, a form of Fed activism over the next year to, to maintain uh, some modicum of, of financial stability and, and growth. And so I want to come back and, and give you an opportunity to, to, uh, to either answer Leacott or to, to join in on, on Plan B.5 or something. You're asking me to take on a guy who's smarter than me, and that's not very pleasurable, but I will do my best. Um, the uh, uh, problem I see, of course, with, with monetary expansion is the degree to which you believe in the the magnitude of the excess, uh, if you if you really believe as I do that this this imbalance is of a magnitude that makes it fundamentally almost impossible to push uh, domestic wages, uh, then you would see why I don't believe that that's necessarily the way out of this. I do believe that monetary policy is a way of actually articulating or, or, or handling the amplitude of decline. I think that uh, you know there, there are three transmission mechanisms that uh, I can credit Nuriel with finally explaining to me years ago. Um, but uh, you know those transmission mechanisms are obviously you know protectionism, which is the uh, the thing that dare not speak its name in a globalized country, a globalized world, right? Uh, and, and so let's just chuck out that for uh, the time being. The second one being uh, devaluation, which would be typical. Uh, debtor countries uh, devalue and uh, creditor countries appreciate. And uh, as Nuriel just explained to us, uh, that's just not likely to happen right now unless it's done in a coordinated global way. The third, and the, the least attractive of all, is uh, deflation in the, creditor con the debtor country and, uh, and inflation in the creditor countries. 
And, and in fact, that is the direction that, but for the intervention, the monetary intervention that we've seen, is the preponderance of forces bearing down on the United States, at least, uh, and to a certain extent, parts of the Eurozone. So um, I, I think that, that it's our only defense uh, with, a, with a fiscally uh, uh, you know, unwilling to act Congress uh, it's, it is, in fact, our only defense. Whether or not you can use it as the, uh, uh, the string that you can push on, uh, so to speak, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I have my doubts that, uh, uh, you know, obviously protectionism is a way out. Um, if you believe that uh, the current uh, geopolitical uh, stability or, or instability um, can be maintained uh, in a protectionist environment, I have my doubts about that as well. Uh, and so consequently, you know, if, if we can't devalue, or correspondingly, if everybody devalues at once, which achieves the same outcome, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, we, we are uh, going to need to try to use monetary policy, but, but it's not necessarily, in my opinion, going to be a positive driver towards real expansion and recovery. And, and one of the concerns I have, and I, I agree with, with Liakot that, that absolutely, the, the, the slide that we flashed up there showing the little parabola was, was a bit of a cheat, uh, especially since the parabola just sort of ticked up recently. So, um, but the, the, uh, the, the, the truth is, is that that's, that is what happened from the moment that uh, it was announced. And I would, I would, just as a market observer right now, I'm looking at oil and I'm looking at, uh, at, at, at commodities, especially non-precious non uh, commodities, and certainly looking at at least the last, what, four or five trading days, six trading days in the stock market. And you, you have to scratch your head and say, what is the market telling you about the prospects for additional easing going forward? They're telling you that everyone's going to monetize. They're telling you the ECB is going to rush to monetize. They're telling you the Fed's going to provide whatever, whatever support it can to monetize. And everyone's going to be monetizing because that's the only way out. And in fact, I believe the drive of oil from uh, the, the low 90s up to where it, uh, it leveled off the last few days is in fact presaging uh, to a certain extent anticipated monetization, future monetization. So um, that, that of course had a negative yeah. effect, right? It had, a, it had the effect of effect, effectively stalling the economy because discretionary spending was impacted. Dan, I wanted to bring Nuriel and Bruce <coughs> in, in, and Bob also. But Nuriel, Bruce, uh, Bob. Well, on Liekhardt's uh, point, um, by the way, your book is brilliant, you know, uh, Lords of Finance, you know, if no one has read it or few of you have not, you should, uh, it's a most thorough analysis of what happened to the global economy between World War I and the cause of the Great Depression. But I think that, you know, in some sense on the monetary policy issue, we learned some of the mistakes of the Great Depression or even of Japan, uh, you know, the Great crash became a great depression because we had the constraint on monetary policy of the gold standard. We had a monetary contraction and an easing. Uh, we were, didn't have Keynesian economics and we had fiscal contraction and we decided liquidate, liquidate, liquidate and then we let thousands of banks uh, uh, collapse and yet then massive uh, banking crisis runs and then a credit crunch. So the lessons were learned and this time around, the fact that the Great Recession did not become Great Depression 2.0 yet is because we had massive monetary easing, you know, policy rates at zero, Q1, Q2, credit easing, we had massive fiscal stimulus and we decided to backstop putting fans, guarantee bailout, banks and other financial institutions. Of course, the side consequence has been a massive releveraging of the public sector to the point in which some countries now have lost uh, market access like in the Eurozone, so we have a sovereign debt problem we have to face in some parts of the world, but we've done some of that. But if I think ahead uh, on monetary policy more, and I'm sure the Fed, the ECB, and everybody else is going to do it, the credit channel is not working anymore because, you know, M0 in the US has tripled, but M1, M2, M3 credit growth are zero if not negative because velocity has collapsed. Banks, because of either credit supply or credit <coughs> man constraints, are not lending out, but they're hoarding all that stuff in terms of excess reserves that are now over a trillion dollars. So that channel transmission doesn't work to a real economy. The wealth effect the asset inflation has worked twice, but if the economy remains dynamic at this point in the run, when the Fed, uh, uh, say, announced uh, Operation Twist, the market fell 5% in two days. So that channel is not at work anymore if the economy remains weak. And the only channel through which uh, monetary easing can work is through the exchange rate. 
But the point is that it's a zero-sum game because the US needs a weaker dollar to grow its exports since domestic demand is dynamic. The Eurozone needs a weaker euro because otherwise the periphery is going to implode and eventually exit. The UK needs a weaker pound because they're going into a recession. The Swiss were so worried about the Swiss franc being so strong, decided to pack to the uh, euro. The Japanese need uh, a weaker yen because domestic demand is dynamic and they're going to intervene if the yen becomes stronger than 75. China wants to maintain its export-led growth model with big currency and they're shot in US dollar. And everybody else in emerging Asia and Latin America says, if China doesn't move, uh, I don't want to let my currency appreciate, we're going to lose market shares to China. So Chinese shadow in the US dollar, everybody else shadows China through forex intervention, easier monetary policy, capital controls, or any combination of those things. And therefore, the adjustment of relative prices is not occurring. So this is zero-sum game in currency. If my currency is weaker, somebody else has to be stronger. If my trade uh, deficit is smaller, somebody else has small, uh, surplus has to be smaller. So the sum of all trade balances in the world is equal to zero. We don't trade with the moon or Mars. And we're in a world in which overspending country I need to reduce their, their deficit, but the oversaving ones don't want to reduce their trade balance and have a structural adjustment towards a domestic demand. And that's the fundamental problem we're facing right now. So suppose we had, and that's the global imbalance problem, Suppose the euro falls in value by 30% so that the periphery doesn't have to exit the eurozone, euro store competitiveness. Think about the implication on US economic growth of a euro not being at 135, but being at parity with US dollar. And what's gonna happen to China since China is shadowing US dollar? Chinese exports to eurozone are already collapsing. If the euro falls another 30% relative to RMB, that's a risk of a hard landing in China. We have barely positive economic growth and we're gonna have massive fiscal drag next year and we'll have deleveraging of the private sector. And the only thing we can hope is the dollar should become weaker rather than stronger. So if the euro were to fall by 30%, that's a disaster for growth in US. That's a disaster for growth in China. Uh, what's the solution? Probably the solution will be that the adjustment within the Eurozone should occur with the periphery exiting and going back to national currency, and then the core and the German, Deutsche Mark, whatever, appreciating sharply. So you have an adjustment within the Eurozone rather than an adjustment of the Euro relative to the dollar or the RMB. But if you're going to do that, that's what happened in the 30s. When the US went off gold and they, they valued, right? What did they do? They decided to do a conversion or repeal of the gold clause that essentially converted all the contracts that were denominated in gold into dollar, depreciated. And that's why you avoid the balance sheet effect. So the day where Greece is going to go off uh, the euro and they're going to go to the drachma, the real value of their euro debts overnight goes up by 100%. And therefore, they have to convert those uh, euro debts into drachma debts, so imposing a massive capital levy on your creditors. You know, Argentina pacified in 2001 their dollar debts. The United States decided to repeal the gold clause. Italy, Spain, Greece are going to have to leave and then to convert their euro debts into new lira, new drachma, imposing another massive capital levy on the creditors. So you'll have another round of, of defaults that tells you that at the end of the day, you're going to have massive debt restructuring as well. So we live in a world in which there are fundamental imbalances and adjustment is going to be very painful. So it's not going to be easy and monetary policy alone is not going to do it. Bruce? Yeah, I, I just, just to th make the situation appear even worse. Uh, <laughs> worse Nuria, wow. Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, keep in mind that the, 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 we always talk about the Fed as if it's the Federal Reserve Board, but it's not. It's the Federal Open Market Committee, which includes five additional uh, members uh, to the board uh, uh, among the, the regional Federal Reserve banks. And these banks are very heavily dominated by people who are absolutely opposed to any kind of monetary expansion whatsoever. Uh, I, I, I don't know the exact membership of the board right at the moment, but you, you constantly hear uh, the presidents from uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, and uh, Philadelphia, and Richmond, and a number of others saying we need to be tightening, we need to be tightening, because inflation's right around the corner. This is what we've been hearing for three years. Inflation, hyperinflation is right around the corner. Just look at the money supply. And, well, where's damned inflation? You know, it ain't there. But these same people keep saying the same thing, and you keep hearing the idiots at the Wall Street Journal say, we need a strong dollar, and they rant and rave at any idea of weakening the dollar, no matter how sensible and obvious 
uh, the necessity is, uh, you know, admitting that there's a lot of constraints uh, political to be able to do that. We're, and we've, and the, the guy who's probably going to win, has a very good chance of winning the Iowa caucuses, thinks the first thing we should do is abolish the Federal Reserve and go back to a gold standard. I mean, you have to deal with the fact that crazy people are in charge of policy and a great many of our most important institutions at the Fed and the Congress, and we have to accept the reality that we can't we have no scope for action unless something is done to change the political environment, and I don't know what that is. Right. Uh, uh, Bob, Bob Hockett, Bob, you should acknowledge your uh, yes. New York Fed, Fed credentials. Yeah, so I have to, I have to sort of preempt a, a possible uh, problem. And, and this is, so some of you might know that um, who have read the, the sort of invitation when I'm not over at Cornell, I'm over at the New York Fed. So I promise I'm actually speaking in my own capacity at this point, not in any sort of <laughs> Fed capacity. Um, that being said, uh, I'm not quite as pessimistic about the Open Market Committee uh, as Bruce is, but I'm on the other hand a bit more uh, pessimistic about the efficacy of of future monetary easing um, than is uh, Leah Cut. Basically for the same reason that I'm pessimistic about uh, the, the efficacy of tax policy, right? And it's just the pushing on the string problem, right? So insofar as, again, uh, you've got lots of individuals out there uh, delevering and retrenching uh, and hence uh, reluctant to spend, uh, I don't think that you're going to have enough uh, desire to borrow in order to make monetary policy very helpful unless you've got demand generation taking place in a serious way. In other words, insofar as our problem is an oversupply problem, an under-demand problem, increasing the money supply further is, is, is bound to be of limited efficacy, I think. I do think this is a remarkably resourceful open market committee, and I think it's a remarkably resourceful Fed. I'm also a little bit less pessimistic about future commodity inflation as a result of more easing policies than is Dan, because I think that this particularly resourceful, and if not brilliant, Federal Open Market Committee could always start shorting commodities in order to sort of compensate for those kinds of effects if it were, um, you know, wanting to get even more uh, sort of innovative. But um, so, uh, but that, you know, I don't think that's likely to happen. I'm quite, I, I don't think that they'll ever go quite that far. And indeed, uh, insofar as they don't, then Dan's concerns about rising commodity prices or more commodity speculation, I think, are all the more uh, poignant. But again, quite apart from all of that, I just think that insofar as what we're faced with is effectively a, a collective action problem, lots of people not willing to spend individually, you've got to have a concentrated uh, 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 addition uh, to uh, uh, aggregate demand in the economy. Otherwise, cheaper money just isn't going to be sought, no matter how cheap it becomes. Nobody wants to borrow while they're delivering. I'm going to take one more question. Hedrick Smith here. And uh, <clears throat> Thanks. Hedrick Smith, PBS. I'm also writing a book on this topic, and so much of what you all said uh, brings home so thank you for your ideas. I wonder if you'll forgive me if I raise a political and a diplomatic question. Um, <coughs> diplomatic, China. Everybody thinks we should get China to do something about their currency and we should devalue the dollar relative to China. Just wonder whether or not anybody here on the panel has a good practical idea on how we're going to go about that. And the second question is, you all are all talking about growth and the dominant debate in Washington today is about austerity. It's about uh, dealing with the deficit and the long-term debt. Any ideas about how to change the nature and the thrust of the debate? Let's start with Leo, who hasn't uh, weighed in recently. I, I think that the bank is, is the most opportunity we have to, to sort of move away from the fiscal austerity argument, Rick. I think that, that the, infrastructure the infrastructure bank, uh, if, if thoughtfully conceived, could be a debate and in an in a, in a inquiry apart from fiscal austerity. You, to seed it would be de minimis monies in, in, in a relative sense. And again, if you brought in the pension community and, and had good structure, good governance, I think you could, could obviate some of the concerns about austerity. In terms of China, uh, I, I thought we had an amazing shot three years ago. I think we, we've blown the shot for a full year. Uh, they're now in the midst of their own transition, uh, which is largely going to coincide with ours. And uh, so I, I see nothing happening for a year. Uh, but I, I think that we've, we've spent way too much time on the currency of China and not nearly enough on the structure of China, the subsidy market, the subsidies, the intellectual property theft. And uh, uh, I think we could at least use this year to broaden the debate beyond currency so that when 
there is a pre new president, whether it's, it's Mr. Obama's re-election or, or somebody else, they pray God not, the, uh, uh, that uh, at least there's a foundation to go forward. Uh, Lee Clinton. Um, on China, the, I mean, my only uh, suggestion is that making it a bilateral thing between the U.S. and China is, uh, I think, would be disastrous and will be completely counterproductive and that the only way to tackle the China issue is on a multilateral basis within G20 because everyone's got a problem with China and if we make it us against them, we won't get, any far, uh, go, get very far. Nuria? Um, well, you know, until now, I would say, while the U.S. was uh, unhappy with China, they started to let their currency appreciate 5 6% per year. Their inflation was a bit higher than ours, so there was some nominal and real appreciation. They were talking about all the reforms that are going to increase uh, consumption, reduce savings. So I think the Treasury had taken the view, let's see if they do it. It's not ideal. We'd like them to do more like 10%, but uh, we can live with it. Uh, I fear that what may be happening, however, is that uh, China is now slowing down, and with Europe in trouble, it's going to slow down even more. They have already decided the last few weeks to slow down the rate of uh, appreciation to a crawl. They might altogether stop it if their economic growth uh, starts to weaken further. Uh, U.S. economic growth is uh, very anemic. You'll have a fiscal drag next year. Unemployment rate is going to be higher. Our bilateral trade balance with China is as large as ever. The Chinese trade balance is shrinking only because their exports to Europe is falling and because oil prices have been high this year. So they can claim their trade balance is reduced, but bilaterally is not. And, uh, and I think that, you know, the Republican side of it is making noises on uh, how tough you have to get, uh, you know, with the Chinese, and that's going to be the politics of the election. And at some point, even the rhetoric from the White House has to become a little more kind of at least the rhetoric, if not the action. So if the US uh, goes back to stall speed, and same thing is happening in China, and Europe is in a recession, I think uh, the, the trade tensions could become next year quite uh, severe, and the administration has uh, in their pocket a whole bunch of ideas about how you can do things that are WTO uh, legal and kosher that will put pressure on China. The usual argument has been, you know, if you put pressure on China, they're gonna instead uh, bulk and not do anything, and we've tried to uh, do that, and that has not been counterproductive. The reality, however, has been also that, you know, if you go soft on them, then, then they don't do much as much. So the question is, well, what's better, to, to become tougher on them and force them to do more at the time where they have their own political transition next year and they're going to do less, or to go soft on them when, uh, when they have these uh, trade tensions? Uh, I think that the, the trade tensions are going to escalate next year. You have a political transition in China, you have a political transition or the election in the U.S. Uh, the economy is going to be weak in the U.S. and China. The imbalance is going to stay there. And, uh, and that tension is going to remain, and it might reach actually a boil. Uh, before I blink, bring us to an official close, I wanted to thank a couple individuals. Uh, I, don't know, Sam, I mentioned Sam Sradden, who is the senior program manager at the Economic Growth Program, who um, virtually single-handed makes all this happen. Uh, I think Sam is probably organizing the reception now. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Cameron Callan, uh, King and Spalding, who has been one of our principal sponsors of our World Economic Roundtables, out of which uh, 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 Dan and Bob and Nuriel's paper uh, 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 emerged. Also Aaron Stopak, who's a charter member of that, that group as well. Uh, Again, thank you to the authors of the paper. Thank you to Leo Hendry, Bruce Bartlett, and Leah Khad Ahmed for very valuable uh, comments. And uh, we, we do have a little reception. Um, hope you'll stay around if you feel like it and avoid the rain for another half hour, 45 minutes, uh, and talk to the authors and, uh, and the panelists. Thank you.